Hey everyone, I'm Michael, and welcome to episode 2 of Little Big Planet Tutorials from Matrixel Dev. The Little Big Planet Context Contest has started, and the level is now available for you to copy. You have until, I believe, April to submit. But I'm not going to be doing a submission, so why am I in the level? Well, because I figured it would be good to explore the level and Mark Hall's as, as principal level designer at Zoomer Digital, see what, what tips he's used and what can be applicable to this series. And what I mean by that is I want to talk about some of the things he's done in the level, some of the decisions he's made, and why he's made them, why you should probably consider making them as well. Um, so what can we learn from the bubble blockout? That's what this episode's about. Now each concept that I cover, I'm going to cover briefly, because I don't want this video to be too long, but each concept I cover will be either covered in a previous video or a future video, and I will tell you guys which. But let's get started. The first big concept is is to not glue things together. Now, I already explained this in a previous video, that gluing things together in Little Lake Planet, as well as bolting, connecting, or wiring things together creates a rigid connection, but this isn't about rigid connections. This is about being able to move things around in your level. Um, see, these platforms are not moved or, or are not glued together, and they don't need to be, and they shouldn't be, because let's say that I wanted to remove this entire bottom area, or you know, move it. I can. I didn't have to detach it from the rest of the level. There was nothing important uh, on it, as far as script goes. Now, cover that. Um, but I was able to take this piece of material and move it, for example, over here bit of a weird decision, but, you know, I, I, I have that ability. Anyway, um, the idea here is that you will most definitely want to move pieces of your level around as you get feedback from playtesters yep, um, later on, or as you just change your mind about how you want to lay things out. You'll want to move things around and you'll want to do it a lot. If you have everything glued down and set in stone, it's going to be really freaking annoying to have to unglue everything and disconnect everything. And I just want to move this one piece of geometry to the left by one unit. Now I have to tear apart my entire damn level. You don't want to deal with that nightmare. It's not fun. It's annoying. It's tedious. So don't glue things together. And design your level in a way where each piece is kind of... Treat it like Lego. Um, each piece slots in together in a certain way, but crucially, it slots in. It's not, you know, I, I guess also treat it like building a computer. Everything kind of fits together, but it's not soldered in place, so you can remove things and replace things. That's kind of, kind of handy. That's tip number one, is to, uh, is, is to keep your geometry separate and mod shiller, treat it like a piece of Lego. Next is level script. I said I would get into it. Uh, the idea here, and I would probably use a game engine if I could to demonstrate this, but the idea here is to keep your script, your programming, your logic, separate from your actual level geometry. For example, it might be tempting, for example, to take this piece of music here and put it on the on the level, for example, because you know the player is going to spawn here. So, I want this music track here, but it's a better way to do it. The game has something called sticker panel, and I rarely, if at all, see people use sticker panel for stickers. I sometimes forget that's something you can use them for, because they're so much better at being scriptable options. What do you mean by that? Well, a sticker panel has pretty important properties for acting as a level script. First of all, it always floats. It can move, it can be influenced by physics in the game, as we'll soon see, but it's not generally affected by gravity. It won't fall through the level. And crucially, it is not glidable. Stackboy cannot stand on a piece of sticker panel. No matter how hard he tries, he will not land on this sticker panel. He will fall right through it. So that means, if Sackboy cannot stand on the sticker panel, 
It also means that this sticker panel won't collide with other level objects. So let's say that I made this sticker panel or two layers thick. I could still overlap it with the level up helmet. And that's crucial for something that I demonstrated in the previous video with written connections, making it look like a connector is actually connected to the level ceiling when it's not. Uh, that's crucial for that, but it's also it also means that you can place these literally anywhere in your level. You can even overlap sticker panel with other pieces of sticker panel, and it'll just work. So if you can at all avoid it, your level uh, script off the geometry and keep it on your sticker panel. And here's another reason why you want to do that. This music piece. I want to keep it here. It looks like it's attached to the level geometry. If I wanted to move the geometry but keep the music in, pe or music in place, and it were attached to the geometry, well, I wouldn't be able to do this. Notice how that music scene did not move. Because it's on a sticker panel completely separate from this piece of level geometry. So I can move the geometry around freely and not affect the script. But I can also move the script around and not affect the geometry. That's good to know. Good to do. Let's continue on with some of the other mechanics, or some of the other level design uh, tips that he has uh, taken in. Or let, 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 sorry, I'm going to retry that entire sentence. Let's move on to some of the other level design decisions that Mark Hall has made and why he made them. So, over here. We have this little red guy here moving back and forth and the idea is get in the bubble like this and you can only launch yourself up and the idea is that you want to time this just right such that you don't hit the red guy because he will kill you you have to time it like that so how does this all work well, if we go into preview mode, or out of preview mode, what he's done is he has two pieces of sticker panel here, one that's static and one that's able to move. See, they are in fact able to move. And he's attaching his piston from the static sticker panel to the dynamic sticker panel, and he set it to move back and forth like this. And then on the actual red guy, he has a tag on it, or no, he has a follower on the red guy, and a tag on the moving sticker panel. And the follower is set to follow that tag. What that means, if I pause the game, I move the red guy up a few grid units. Notice how the sticker panel is still here. When I unpause, the red guy is going to realize, oh, I'm off course. Snap right back into place. And this goes both ways. Let's say that we moved the piece of sticker panel. Move the base here because that will move the entire piston. I'll move it up here. And as you can see, the red guy will automatically adjust his course to match the new location of the pixel, of the sticker panel, and it will now start breaking the level. What this means is we can move this entire, uh, we, we can move these objects independently of each other. The object that makes the guy move around and the actual guy itself, we can move them independently. And they're able to coexist, which means that we can copy these and we can move these around the level without having to tear things apart. And maybe we, won't, we want to change the way this, this dude moves around, and we'll see an example of that later on. But, Next tip, layers. In Little Big Planet three, or in Little Big Planet one, sorry, had three layers. Little Big Planet two, we had three layers. And for a long while, three layers was all we ever needed. I'm sure, there were a few Mad Men who created layer glitches and fifty layer glitches and hundred layer glitches, and all that stuff. But you know, we could only ever play on the first three lever or layers. Little Big Planet 3, we got 13 more, totaling up to 16 layers. Here's the thing, the game 
handle them very well. I mean, it, it's serviceable, it's workable, you can play on them, but create mode doesn't handle them well. Let's take a simple piece of full grid unit cardboard. And I'm guilty of this in some of my older levels, but um, you might be tempted, for example, to create a massive big ground area, right? That is all 16 layers. Look at what went wrong. I zoomed into the level, did a 4x4 grid unit object, it's 16 layers long, and my entire screen, my entire 34-inch ultra-wide monitor is filled with cardboard now. Recording in four, or in 1440p, 16 by 9, so I do have pillar boxing on the side, but you know, my entire monitor, my entire playable game window is filled, and that's not great, because I cannot see where I'm going, and oh, I want to move up. I, I do believe that at this point I have just obstructed the level geometry. Yeah, I've smeared right through the level. Um, yeah. <laughs> I did not see that until I stopped smearing, and now the entire level is broken. So, um, yeah, when you're placing these objects, you definitely don't want to be doing... And, and here's another issue with 16 brushes. Um, you notice how the entire screen is black other than the game HUD. That's because the camera has clipped through object and is pulling it. You cannot see it. <laughs> um, so the game definitely doesn't handle this very well. So, how do we use 16 layers effectively? How do we not tear our brains out every time we want to use them? Well, what Mark Hall has done, and what you should be doing, is yes, he's using 16 layers, and that's great, but he's only using the active layers. What that means is, as you traverse through the level, any area where Sackboy can walk on, will at most be three layers thick. So, this ground area here is only two layers, and then there's another area here, a layer launch here on it, that's one layer thick. Sackboy can walk on these, perfectly fine. In order to get to the upper layers, he has to layer launch himself, like this. At which point he is now in the background, and continue playing the level. This is easier to edit, because once we're not dealing with those foreground layers anymore, well, we only have to think about this as a standard a little bit Planet 2 level. As far as the game is, not even... It just feels like Little Big Planet 2 right now, that we are... or we happen to be in the background layer. Or what would be the background layers. So yeah, um, that is layers. You want to stick to limiting how many playable layers uh, you use at any given time in your level. And if you do that, you won't be pulling your hair out every time you build with layers. Because you won't be. Anyway, this area I kind of broke in the previous take. But um, this area here demonstrates effective use of rich connections. See, this area is relatively small. And what Mark has done, I do believe these switches, if I look... Um... Uh, let's see. So, the, the two-way switch. Or wait, let me let me see. Okay, so it's brushed sheet metal, that is new. Way switch. Uh, this two-way switch is not group is not glued to the level's wall. It is set to er, to static physics, so we can move this around. I won't do because it's not, it's not flush with the grid and it breaks. Um, but it's still rigidly connected to something. But crucially, it's rigidly connected to a circuit board that's sitting on a sticker panel. Um, so this is a situation where rigid connections are effectively used because. Um, this entire sticker panel microchip here is 
is dependent on these switches being loaded in. So if this were a dynamic thermometer level, and we walk in range of this sticker panel, we'd want both switches to be loaded in, because um, they are important to, that, to the functionality of the sticker panel. So it's a good use of rich connections in this case. Um, but crucially, what he's not done is he's not glued these any of the walls, and he's not placed the actual microchip on the actual level geometries, and move all this stuff around, and so it's all dependent on each other. It's not dependent on the actual level, and that's important. Okay. Um. This is another gameplay tip I can give you guys for boxing the levels and stuff like that. Um, is red is a very uh, color. Yeah, my favorite color actually. But it also indicates something in this case. It indicates that if you touch it, you die. If you touch red, you die. I'll stop subjecting Richie to this torture. Anyway, um, the important thing here is to use these sort of indicator colors to subconsciously indicate to the player what this means. So, in this level, we're consistent about it, we always know that if we touch something that's red, it's bad. So if you use red consistently as a bad indicator, then the player will know to avoid anything red. Mirror's Edge does this. It uses red to indicate to the player that you can parkour off that option. For example, um, it, it, it's a mechanic called Runner's Vision. Um, if you see a red ramp, you could run and jump off it. If you see a red hole, you can climb on it. If you see a red fence, you can springboard off it. Stuff like that. It becomes subconscious to the player to not even think, that object's red, I'm gonna go to it, and I'm gonna hop off it. And in this case, we're gonna see, that object's red, I should not touch it. That's the idea. Indicate to the player using color and stuff like that what things are. Ideally, the best tutorial is the one that doesn't exist. So, uh, or the one that the player is not aware exists. So there's that. And it helps. Anyway. Moving on, so going back to that uh, earlier area where the where the red guy was moving back and forth, that was right here. Um, we can see another demo of that old red guy. He is same red guy. You touch him, you die. Um, but crucially, he is he has a different AI, different script. What he's doing instead is he's following a sticker panel that's attached to a spinning bubble. So he'll over it around the bubble, and it looks like this. So the idea is that you have to climb your- oh god. You have to actually climb in the bubble, that would work. Again, you have to actually climb in the bubble, Richie, that would work. Anyway, um, the idea is that you have to aim yourself, which you do in this case. You don't want to touch the red guy, so if you climb this incorrectly, you're going to hit one of the red guys, and that's bad. But. Uh, what he's done is he's changed the behavior, and he was able to do that because the red guy is independent of the way he moves. Well, just follow the nearby tag. Andy. Anyway, that's that mechanic. Well, the red guy just follows whatever the tag is doing, and, you know, it's up to the tag to decide how it moves. In this case, it's just you know, moved by a motorboat. Okay. Um, so this is right here. This is another demo of using player launchers to launch us back into the foreground. Ever more than three playable layers, of always use layer launchers for possible. I've already completed this section, so. So, over here we've got the Lost Water, so there's nothing really to comment on there. Um, over here, uh, the mechanic is you have to get in the bubble, and you have to spin it counterclockwise, or spin it clockwise to move the, uh, big box that the bubble is attached to the left. That, in turn, opens a door that you have to walk through before it moves over to the right, so a simple puzzle. Um, 
And the idea here is, uh, uh, or the thing that I want to cover, as I get warped way back into the head, I don't want to be, is how this thing moves. Let's turn on preview mode and, you know, get it moving. Let's pause. And go out of, or out of preview mode. And as you can see, we've got a piece of sticker panel here. And a piston attached to another piece of sticker panel over here. I can assume that one of these has the logic on it, I don't know. But the important thing here is that the... Um, looks to me, so the box is following the sticker panel. Oh, in this case, the sticker panel is glued to it, so that's an anchor problem. I don't particularly like that, but there's probably a reason for it, so I'll let it slide. Um, but, you know, this might be something that we want to move around, so it's a good idea to have that sticker panel anchor point so we can go ahead and drag it. And up the rest of the option. Okay, I see how this works now. So, so yeah, it is. Or the actual physical box is still independent of the sticker panel. Um, so that's good. But we can move everything around. I'll follow. So that's that game play side. Same as the same deal as the red guy here. It happening again with the sticker panel with the tag on it. And then the red guy following the tag. It's the same deal here. The blue box is following the sticker panel with the tag. Alright. So, what else is there? So, over here. Okay, so over here what we have is a really difficult puzzle. We have a puzzle where big red object is, uh, is rotating around and we have to be really quick on our timing and on our ability to get through these bubbles so that we don't hit the red, otherwise we will die. This is a really difficult puzzle, and that's cool. But all of these objects are independent of each other, so I could change this gameplay up if I wanted to. And same deal over here. I guess you go down one. I suppose what to do is somehow get up here where get another um I don't know what this is, but it's red, so I'm assuming it's bad. Okay. So in this case what we need to do is open the big door and there's the end of the level. Only neat use of the bubbles to... Well, until you do that, there's... There's an outlet. But... Some takeaways here. Because I've hit the end of the level and I've commented on everything that I can think of. Um, the takeaways here are to build your level in... In a, in a sort of Lego block fashion, so you can take pieces of the level and, you know, them and slot them in out. Uh, you want to keep your script detached from geometry, and the best case of that is, or the simplest case is this music. I want to keep the music there, but I don't want this piece of platform there. You can keep your script detached from geometry, it's really easy to do that. Um, next you want to take advantage of tags and tag followers to be able to create these uh, meanies that are independent of, of their their movement script. So um, in this case the piston moves the meanie back and forth, but the meanie isn't really, he doesn't care how the piston's moving him, he's just following a tag blindly and that tag is being moved by the piston and that allows you to replace the tag with something else. That's actually done up here. Make the circle objects. Or the meanies that circle around the bubbles, sorry. And third takeaway here is to or the fourth takeaway is to avoid using 
more than three playable layers at any given time using layer launchers to launch attack point in the background. We should get to this. So we can treat the level effectively on the Big Planet 2 level. And... Uh, what else did we cover? We covered indicators. So, indicating to the player, okay, this thing is red, so it's bad. Be able to be consistent with that. And, um... Basically about it. Most of the level is crashing everything that we learned. So, that's gonna do it for this video. I will be covering a lot of these concepts in more detail in my own episodes. So I want to cover different ways you can separate logic from your level geometry. I want to cover different ways you can build out your Lego blocks and, and all that stuff, and different ways you can um, uh, indicate to the player what's bad and what's good to touch and stuff like that. So that'll be in the future tutorials, but I wanted to go through this level and kind of walk you guys through some of the design decisions that Mark Hall has made and why you might want to make them in your own levels. Now with that said, that's going to do it for this video. As always, I'm Michael. I hope you enjoyed the video, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Learn something. Thanks for watching. I said this, but I'll see you guys in the next one. I butchered my outro. Anyway. <laughs> I'll see you guys in the next video. Thanks for watching.